Hello hockey fans and welcome back to another video. Any person with even a passing interest in the sport will already know that the game of hockey contains six different playing positions. Center, left wing, right wing, left defenseman, right defenseman and goalie. While each of these positions have undergone extensive changes over the years, and while the way in which they are played varies greatly from one skater to the next, this setup has been a staple of the sport for well over a century now. However, there was once a time where teams also iced a seventh player known as the Rover. So what was the Rover? Well, as the name suggests, a rover would spend their time skating up and down the rink while providing assistance on either side of the puck. Unlike the other six positions though, the rover didn't have a set place to play, so they would often roam the ice at will and contribute both offensively and defensively depending on where their team needed them most. This meant that a rover could either be used to generate scoring chances as a fourth forward option, help keep the puck out of the net as a third defenseman, or anything else in between. In fact, the rover would become such a prestigious position within the sport that many of its most proficient players have since been inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame, including such legends as Hobie Baker, Newsy Lalonde, and even Lester Patrick. But what happened to the rover? Why is the position no longer used in the sport today? Well, in this video, we're going to find out. So join me as we explore the rise and fall of hockey's forgotten position. Before we begin, this video is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes to help you explore new skills, deepen existing passions, or get lost in creativity. Skillshare has thousands of online classes in a wide variety of topics such as graphic design, creative writing, photography, and so much more. My personal favorite has been the Learn Premiere Pro and edit a how-to video for beginners in their film and video topic, as I've been wanting to learn some new editing tricks in order to make my video stand out from the crowd that little bit more. And it's great that I can simply log on, find a class in the exact topic that I need, and learn from someone who clearly knows what they're talking about. Not only that, there are no ads anywhere on Skillshare's platform, and they are always launching new premium classes. So you'll never have to watch a commercial mid-class, and you can instead focus on learning the most up-to-date information in your chosen field. If joining a community like this sounds like your cup of tea, boy do I have just the deal for you. The first 1,000 people who click the link in the description or the pinned comment of this video will get access to a free trial of Skillshare's premium membership. That way you can try before you buy, and maybe even learn something new along the way. So if you're interested in picking up a new skill, taking a talent to the next level, or getting lost in all things creativity, click the link in the description or the pinned comment down below, and enjoy a free trial to Skillshare's premium membership on me. You're welcome, folks. Skillshare. Explore your creativity. But anyway, back to the video. Now in order to understand how the rover came to be, and why it has been lost to the history books, we need to go all the way back to the origins of the sport. When the game of hockey first came into existence around 1875, the on-ice product was a lot different to what we see today. After all, teams typically iced nine different players at any one time, the concept of a defenseman didn't even exist yet, and forward passing was against the rules. It really was a different time, folks. As the years went on though, and indoor hockey began to grow in popularity, teams had to make some changes in order to adjust to the limited ice surface. In fact, by the year 1880, most North American hockey teams had reduced their rosters from nine players to seven, which included three forwards, two halfbacks, a fullback, and a goalie. Though the game would continue to see a plethora of changes over the coming years, teams would stick to seven on-ice players for the rest of the 19th century. During this span, the six positions that we all recognize today would begin to take shape, as teams would ice three forwards, two defensemen known as the point and cover point positions at the time, as well as a goalie who protected the net. However, the seventh player would take on a much more varied role compared to his contemporaries. Whether they were generating offense as a fourth forward, or supporting the back end as a third defenseman, the sixth skater quickly became known as the Rover, due to their need to roam the ice and provide assistance on both sides of the puck. 
Not only would the position become a staple of the sport, especially amongst the Canadian clubs and teams, the rover would typically be played by the best member of a team, since it required a strong skating ability, a versatile skill set, and an unmatched level of stamina. In fact, many of the greatest players of the era would try their hand at the position at some point in their careers, with a number of them cementing their place amongst the best of the best due to their performance while playing as a rover. However, as the world entered the 20th century and the game of hockey continued to develop, the rover's place within the sport was soon brought into question. Thanks to the introduction of forward passing, the emergence of the centre, left wing and right wing forward positions, as well as the overall skill level of the player base notably improving, the rover seemed increasingly unnecessary with each passing season, especially since many of their responsibilities were now being fulfilled by a team centre instead. That said, the position was far from extinct, as it was still being utilised by both the Pacific Coast Hockey Association and the Western Canada Hockey League too. However, the National Hockey Association decided to exclude the Rover and instead use six on-ice players following their formation in 1910, a decision that was upheld by its predecessor, the National Hockey League, from 1917 onwards. Though neither the NHA nor the NHL would ever use the position during league play, several of their teams would end up using a rover at some point in time. Since the Stanley Cup was a challenge trophy during the early 20th century, and non-NHL teams could also compete for the award, a number of sides from the Pacific Coast League would face off against their NHA or NHL counterparts in order to get their hands on the cup. Given that the NHL didn't use a rover and the Pacific Coast League did, a compromise was agreed upon in which each game of the series would alternate between NHL and PCHA rules. That way, either side would be placed at both an advantage and a disadvantage over the course of the series, while ensuring the fairest form of competition between the two sides. With the PCHA continuing to use a rover until the mid-1920s, and since a Pacific Coast League team would challenge for the cup practically every year until then, between 1915 and 1922, three different NHL teams would end up using a rover while playing under PCHA rules. Those three teams being the original Ottawa Senators, the Montreal Canadiens and the Toronto Arenas, the earliest iteration of the Maple Leafs. Not only was the position used during Stanley Cup games, the rover also made its way to the international stage too, since it was included in the first Olympic ice hockey tournament all the way back in 1920. Funnily enough, hockey's first appearance at the Olympics was during the summer event in Antwerp, Belgium, before it was eventually moved to the Winter Olympics for the following tournament due to pretty obvious reasons. Oh, and in case you were wondering, Canada's Winnipeg Falcons would take home the sport's very first gold medal after defeating Team Sweden in the final, though this was unsurprising given that European hockey was still in its infancy compared to their contemporaries across the pond. However, like all good things, the Rovers' place in the sport of hockey would soon come to an end, with many of its responsibilities being overshadowed by other positions, and with a seventh player beginning to overcrowd the ice and reduce the overall speed of play, by 1923, both the Pacific Coast League and the Western Canadian League had moved on from the Rover, switching to the NHL's six-player model instead. Couple that with the Olympics also eliminating the rover following the 1920 tournament, and after several decades of existence, the position was no more. While the game of hockey would leave the rover behind and continue to evolve over the next century, the concept has been referenced a number of times in the many years that have followed. While its departure from the sport would solidify the other six positions that are still used to this day, the term rover has often been attributed to offensively minded defensemen, since they are known to roam the ice and generate scoring chances instead of sticking solely to the blue line. For example, current NHLers like Eric Carlson, Brent Burns and Tyson Barry all have rover-like elements in their respective games, while league legends such as Paul Coffey, Scott Niedermeyer and Sandis Ozelinch were also given this moniker due to their strong puck handling skills, their ability to join the rush and their willingness to play deep in the offensive zone. Not only that, the term rover has also been used to describe an extra attacker when a goalie is pulled, as the player often roams the ice and chips in wherever necessary since their usual position is already filled by a teammate. 
Though it's been a hundred years since it was last used in the sport, and while its existence in the history books has become little more than an afterthought, the Rovers' impact on the game of hockey is still being felt in some capacity to this very day. In fact, you could make the argument that the Rovers' style of play has seen somewhat of a resurgence in recent years, since there has been an increased emphasis on blue liners contributing offensively and forwards being responsible defensively. Of course, it's not quite the same since the structure of the sport has changed dramatically since the Rovers' heyday, but there's no denying that the position made its mark during the game's early years and was an integral piece to many of the sport's first champions, as the Rover was vital in securing both the Stanley Cup and the first Olympic gold medal. Sure, its place in the hockey history books may be brief now, but the Rover certainly played its part in shaping the game that we all know and love today. And that was a look at the history of the Rover. What do you guys think about hockey's forgotten position? Do you think that they were right to leave it in the past, or do you think it should make a return in today's NHL? Let me know in the comments below, I would love to hear what you guys think. But thank you very much for watching guys, I hope you have enjoyed. Please feel free to like, subscribe, share, or watch some of my other videos. Thank you very much for watching, and goodbye! A big thank you to Carl Fairbank, Connor B, Drew Fawcett, Houston NG, Jordan Whitehead, Twin Sanity Dad, and Worthless Pieces for helping support Support this video via Patreon. If you too want to help support the channel a little bit further and get a shout out at the end of every future video, make sure you head over to patreon.com slash oddmanrush and become a patron today.